uh, looks like we're going. OK. All right, thanks, Andrew. Why don't you take it away? Perfect. Uh, yeah, hi, thanks, everyone. Um, great to be with you. Love the Wikimedia and users, libraries user group. We actually had a gathering at Wikimania, and it was great to have a time to talk about issues related to libraries. And as you can imagine, at Wikimania, AI was on the tip of a lot of people's tongues. Um, it kind of just exploded pretty much right after Wikimania last year, end of 2022 into 2023. If you look at the curves, it says, you know, no technology in recent years has taken off as quickly as like ChatGPT specifically, right? But it's been a long, long road to get here. Um, and, you know, um, I'm a computer scientist by training. So even back in the 80s, there was the promise of AI. And and I had always been a, I would say skeptic, but I was never a, um, someone who thought that it was right around the corner, right? It was exciting in the 80s, the 90s, and 2000s. It was like, no, this things are not really moving very quickly here. But um, when Richard and I, you may know that we work with the Metropolitan Museum of Art in the area of like a Wikimedian in residence, and I was doing a lot of Wikimedia strategy and Wikidata work. We were invited to a hackathon by, of all folks, Microsoft, MIT, and the Met. So it was nice three M's and it was based around AI. And the question they had was how might we use AI in the context of open content? And the Met had just released their content under an open access policy. And mind you, this is before the whole chat GPT thing. So, you know, this is still kind of like the beginnings of generative stuff. Uh, the beginnings, um, it had been around for a while, but in terms of popularity wise, it was starting to get to the tools are easier to use. And we actually started doing some experiments there with how we do image recognition and suggesting tags and everything. So we've had for a while um, AI in our movement. And if you know how the um, scoring system works in Wikimedia, you might have seen ORES, O-R-E-S, which is how a lot of the vandal fighting bots and a lot of the um, program and evaluation dashboards work by just having a machine trained system look at an article and look for some markers and predict whether it's a um, a good article or a featured article status or a stub article right so we've had kind of ai and drips and drabs but but now with chat gpt a whole new <laughs> realm of possibilities have opened up we've had tons of people experimenting with generating new images and uploading the commons which has kind of been really exciting but has driven a lot of commons folks crazy uh, people generating text and trying to copy paste it onto Wikipedia and us figuring out, oh, do we go with the guidance of the Copyright Office in terms of that generated text has no copyright, therefore it can be used, um, to things like Richard, which I'll, I'll pass to him in a second, about you know using ChatGPT to guide the first draft of an article, but then the human being comes and obviously puts a big handprint on it to make sure it is um, quality checked and all the problems we have with that. So I thought I'd just kind of at least run down a whole bunch of different types of things that we've done with AI in the movement. But I think we certainly are in a new age and there's no going back. AI is part of our ecosystem. And it's important to know that almost all the major AI systems that are out there are trained on Wikipedia. It is almost always in that first sentence of our systems are trained on Wikipedia, Reddit, blogs, things like that. So, um, you know, we're at South by Southwest recently talking about this. Um, and I told the audience, like, almost the only two sites that are named by name that are trained for ChatGPT are Wikipedia and Reddit. Which one would you want your kids to learn from, Reddit or Wikipedia? <laughs> so um, thank God Wikipedia is around, because if we just learn from Reddit, God help us all. Um, but maybe I'll toss it to Richard, and he can talk a little bit about his uh, I don't know if it was exactly the first, but certainly the first high profile article on Wikipedia that was officially declared as generated by ChatGPT, edited by human hands, and saved on English Wikipedia. And that was for the um, article on artwork title. So maybe, Richard, you could tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So, hi, thanks. I'm, I'm not a computer scientist, uh, and I especially haven't been a computer scientist since the 80s, unless you count, you know. Uh, um, I don't know, the text adventure game I made when I was 10 years old. Um, <laughs> um, uh, I, yeah, so I, 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 yeah, so circularity is definitely an issue. Um, I did experiment, I think it was the first one, actually. I think it was the first, at least the first public one. 
Um, I did experiment uh, to, to try to make a Wikipedia article using uh, ChatGPT. This was actually almost a year ago, but back when it was less considerably less good than it is now, is in some ways. Um, and I picked a, a a, a, a topic that I've thought of a lot. Actually, it's something that I came up a lot, a lot thinking about the Met, the Met working our work with the Met Museum. Um, that's the titles of artworks. It's a very general type of article, um, and so there aren't a lot of like specific sources around it. Um, so it was, it was sort of useful to play with the idea of like, how do you write about this very general topic there where maybe you can synthesize some information from a wide, very wide range of of, of literature. Um, and yeah, so so it was just we created a basic a basic draft. There were no citations. I didn't ask for citations because I knew they would be fake. Um, the, the, the technology is a little bit better at that now, but it's still you know Im obviously imperfect. Uh, there were a lot of uh, you know a lot of very bold generalizations, which I which I edited down. So like this is you know the the names are, are the names of an artwork are drawn from you know uh, so an artist's deep personal experience and and their uh, and their childhood and whatever. And it's like, maybe they, they may be drawn from those things. Um, and so, yeah, so I uh, put in some generalizations and then just try to fill it out, um, try to fill it out with, um, try to expand on points that were mentioned, uh, in, in the, in, and also to sort of, to write, to write against, to see what's wrong, uh, to correct it. Um, so it might be, um, which is, so, so a lot of it was like a, a dialogue an interaction with it to say what's wrong. It also maybe, and, and in fact, if you look at it, the, the history very carefully, it might be that. ChatGPT didn't contribute a lot, an awful lot, <laughs> um, but it was something to react against. And I thought it would be an interesting experiment more than anything else, um, more than maybe a mass creation tool, which is how it might be more typically pitched. Um, yeah, so you can see how it, this is more or less how it worked, how it looked when I first started it. Um, I actually, I, I made a mistake here, which is where I didn't, I, I actually modified it a bit, um, but I didn't declare that yet, but I can just share that version. Um, so I I, 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 added, I removed some stuff that was obviously wrong. I added a lot of uh, like I hedged a lot of the statements, <laughs> um, made them less definitive. Um, this is you know obviously looks a bit different now. Um, people have expanded in different ways. One thing that um, I've noticed is it is a relatively popular article. Um, for you know I mean it's not hugely popular, but it's it gets about about thirty people see it a day, read it a day. Um, which is more popular than most of the fringe, the, the minor topics I write about. Um, so I do think it might be some, it, it might be a useful tool for, um, you know, more of some of these like general topics that, you know, not like, you know, this particular organization, this particular person, but some of these larger concepts that I've been playing with doing this for other, other concepts as well, although I haven't done it uh, much in practice. <laughs> um, but definitely there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot more stuff to do. We, people have done more experiments. Um, on other wikis, uh, so SJ Klein has done some experiments on Wikispore, uh, which is which is sort of an experimental wiki uh, that we're active in. Uh, that um, to to just create articles from whole cloth and you know maybe apply a little bit less uh, a less a little bit less of the the strict scrutiny that would be on Wikipedia. We've done some experiments with um, like particularly place articles, um, so things like streets and buildings and neighborhoods. Um, and sometimes it's useful, sometimes it's not. <laughs> um, sometimes like, like like everything that was in Brooklyn, they would like say it was a diverse neighborhood with a lot of food options, um, <laughs> which I thought was, you know, maybe accurate, um, but not particularly helpful as, as, a, as a Brooklynite. Um, uh, you know, yeah, so I added, I added the references there. Uh, I, these references were added uh, based on some of the, but it was probably based on some of the ideas that the AI gave me. Um, in terms of the things to search for, I do think. Um, I mean, I guess it's sort of get cold, getting old-fashioned search terms, but I do find search terms are particularly useful for Wikipedia articles. Just finding like the right terms to search, um, because often something is known by like ten different names. Yeah. So the 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 yeah, I did I did I specifically did not ask for references uh, for this article because I knew they would be fake. Um, uh, this was before oh. there was the pretense of having real references, so I just asked for text. Um, and I didn't ask for references. Uh, with with the the newer versions uh, that's used in Microsoft Bing and, and other places, there are there are references. Those are mostly accurate, um, but you know obviously they, they they should be very carefully used. And a lot of them are not to what would be called Wikipedia reliable sources as, as well. Great. Yeah, just well, to fill um, in what what yeah, uh, Richard ahead. said, ahead, you know, yeah, and we we discovered very early on that the references were quite poor. Um, 
that's an understatement. <laughs> so even when, you know, ChatGPT, when you told it, okay, uh, generate something, you generate an article about a topic and try to give me references, um, they were terrible. They were looked like New York Times ones or looked like something from a reputable source, but they led to nowhere. There were 404 errors. And then even when you told ChatGPT, absolutely do not give me any reference if it's fake. Do you understand what I'm saying? Please don't even print out a reference unless it's live. It's still printed out bogus, hallucinated references, right? So that's when, as Richard said, you're better off not even having any references to even tempt you, lest you accidentally copy paste it into Wikipedia without checking it. Um, and I think things are improving these days, but in general, that's the problem with a general tool like ChatGPT, where it is, you know, on one second acting like a creative tool to write fiction, and the next time you're trying to uh, get it to write a highly reliable sourced document, they cannot really exist in the same space comfortably. Um, and that's why, you know, you're better off telling it no references and you having to find them yourself. So I think yeah, this for, is, oh, go ahead. Sorry, I keep interrupting. Go ahead, Cliff. Well, I, I, you know, I think we, we want to move on to the questions of information literacy, which we're, we're touching on. But before we get there, I, I thought maybe we just take a little pause and talk about authorship on Wikipedia. Um, and, you know, you, you alluded to this in, in Richard, when you're talking about generating an article that then you edited and, and you know, uh, really crafted. There is no way right now to connect ChatGPT directly to Wikipedia and say, write an article under your own authorship. I mean, it's always going through a human editor uh, or perhaps some kind of bot, I suppose. Um, but can you just talk about uh, the, the way in which you see authorship on Wikipedia changing in light of these tools? Um, it, it, will we still have the same sense of authorship, do you think, over time? And I'm asking you to speculate a little. Um, or is the, the sense in which we have this individual responsibility for our own contributions going to be morphed if we have, you know, all kinds of bots working behind the scenes effectively using us as a amenuasis uh, to, to generate their thoughts online? So I, I'm wondering what you think about authorship uh, in light of some of these tools. Yeah, I guess in, in some sense, authorship is a bit weak on Wikipedia in general, just in terms of not that it's not well documented, it's very well documented, but it's not front and center. Um, like, unlike, you know, obviously social media where people's, you know, like, there's usually a photograph of the person who wrote the article <laughs> at the lead, um, often of the biography. Uh, Wikipedia, obviously, it's it's much more hidden, uh, much much less prominent. Um, so it's less it's less of like a recognition culture, at least at least to the to the reader. Um, uh, but I do think that, um, um, and we're also used to collabor collaboration. So actually, something that that it struck me with ChatGPT and just other tools is that we actually there have been some studies that a lot of the a lot of the information on Wikipedia, a lot of useful information, is not generated by uh, people like Andrew and me who like write a lot of articles and like you know are very well known in, well known in the community. It, they're written by anonymous people um, who are often they don't even have accounts and they maybe they add a few sentences and they're not referenced um, and it's not clear if they're correct or not and someone has to check them. And this actually is not super different than checking uh, an AI written a AI written article or AI written text. Um, so that's how sort of I approached it. Um, so we would call them IP editors, which is maybe I don't know if that's a negative term, but uh, that, that sometimes what people might call and they might say it in a negative way. Oh, this is this is just this, this is just stuff written by an IP editor. But that's sort of how I approached uh, approached some of the AI written text and said, hey, this is let's imagine this is let's imagine this is a person who maybe uh, doesn't understand everything perfectly well, but is trying good faith to help, and let's take their contributions and try to to, to build with it. Um, I, when my 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 impression when I first started it was that um, people often talk about the Frankenstein analogy, um, whether you know it's uh, whether it's Frankenstein's monster or whether it's Victor Frankenstein. Um, I found another character, which is Igor, um, uh, also known as Igor in uh, Young Frankenstein, uh, who's sort of the, the rather clueless but hardworking uh, assistant who you know sometimes sometimes replaces the the, uh, the the human brain with the pigeon brain or the or, <laughs> um, but is, is nevertheless means well and, and reads a lot. Um, and works very hard, but is you know needs some common sense. Andrew, do you have additional thoughts on that question? No, I think Richard put it well. Um, I think you know I was looking through the bot policy as we're as you asked that question, which is a good one. Like we've never really had to think about, boy, you know, of bots contributing significant chunks of prose. <laughs> you know, so I was looking through that. And I'm like. Do we even have like a what is the cop 
copyright of a like we know that a non-humans cannot own copyright right so obviously a software bot cannot you know the same way that we had that problem with the uh the self monkey selfie um in terms of who can hold copyright so obviously a software bot cannot hold copyright but what does happen if we have bots contributing large chunks of text like it just would be cc0 by default or just no copyright by default right and we have no because all, so far our bot policy has been bots can only do certain types of things like revert stuff delete stuff um punctuation tiny little changes uh, but anything else has to be like a human hand in the loop right but this is going to start to bring up new challenges to that um that whole thing because what if we have a reword bot which is going to you know shuffle things around is there a ounce a smidgen of creativity in there or originality then we start to get into some really weird questions about you know how do you attribute a bot what well, do you attribute a bot yeah. and then you might have like Terse spot and verbose spot, and they were fighting with each other. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, well, I, I do want to move on to questions of information literacy, and we, we will, uh, for everybody that's on the discussion with us, open this up for everybody to ask questions. Um, but this is something that's really, you know, obviously at the heart of librarianship that we, we help to connect patrons with reliable sources of information. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, you know, uh, here I am last night preparing for this browsing reddit and i've you know found uh, uh someone talking about ai and and all the librarians in in the r slash librarians channel said um you know we don't use ai and we don't want to use it because it's against our information literacy principles i mean it's it was a pretty bold statement and i don't think it speaks for all librarians it's just in this you know particular discussion but i do think it captures a little bit of a sentiment um and one of the things that i thought about that was you know there was a similar kind of worry at the beginning of Wikipedia, you know, that this is not a reliable source and shouldn't be used in library instruction as well, which we've overcome, you know, like that, that is like in the past now for sure. But, uh, you know, there are serious questions of, you know, misattributions. We've talked about hallucinations, you know, there, there are all kinds of documented problems with the using these, these uh, artificial intelligence tools to generate factual narratives for us. Nevertheless, you know, we're at the very beginning of a process and I wonder how we might think about information literacy, but also in a way in which we capture kind of the moment in time we're in which all these tools are developing and we we don't harden our perspectives. We kind of keep an open mind uh, in the li information literacy world about where this may be heading. So I, that's a big question, um, but I, I, you know, I, I want to think of as a group of librarians here, um, you know, how we can capture some of the energy, put it to good uses you know, caution patrons about the, the negative effects, but still think about, you know, how this may be an aid to, you know, fostering greater information literacy in general. So th that's that's my question. Uh, it's, a, it's a question I have no answer to, but I'd love to hear your thoughts, uh, Richard or Andrew, about that. And then, I, as I say, we'll open it up to others because um, I'd love to hear your, your all thoughts about that too. Yeah, Richard, I'm going to pick on you. Why don't you go ahead? I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Maybe. I guess, I guess it depends on on the the depth that you're into it. Um, so, like on a very, and I guess the, this applies to the internet as a whole. It applies to you know Wikipedia. It, it's been said that Wikipedia is the opposite of television. Um, so, like, um, like you know, television uh, was maybe a, a great institutional tool for for some people, um, and and you know for people with we didn't have you know a, a basic educational background, it was a great ed educational tool. Uh, for others, maybe it attracted them from you know reading their literary journals and stuff, <laughs> um, and you know maybe uh, Wikipedia or in some some as some aspects of the, the the more organized internet are a little bit of the opposite. That maybe you know if you look at them in a very superficial level, they might be detracting from what you might get from a, a more formal source, say in uh, conventional reference work. But if you if you know their background and if you if you understand how it works, then you can actually get more out of it than you would have a, a traditional reference source. Um, I think AI might fit fit that latter category a bit. That if you're using it just on the surface, you can get an extremely poor result. Um, but if you understand how it's working, and if you you use it with you know media literacy, I think it can be a valuable tool. And obviously, it's still super early in terms of I mean the both the technology and the norms around it. Um, but I think that properly used, it is an important part of of information, uh, the information ecosystem. But, you know, if you're using on a service level, that could detract a lot from, you know, obviously people just like typing all their questions to ChatGPT and expect the answer correctly. That's not a good solution. 
Yeah, I, I've been trying to figure out myself what my sentiments around it. As Cliff said, I, I understand the librarians having a kind of visceral reaction to it. Um, but I, too, have been trying to figure out whether it is like the early days of Wikipedia. And eventually, of course, we're all going to come around to the fact that AI is part of our lives. And it's on balance a force for good. Um, but I think it faced the same problems as Wikipedia, right? In terms of like, it's garbage in, garbage out. Wikipedia is only as good as the reliable sources and the verifiable content we have out there. And if those are um, heavily Western, heavily male, and not gender balanced, and not knowledge, um, not not seeing good knowledge equity, then it's Wikipedia is only going to be as good as that, right? And the same thing holds for AI, right? Which is why it's so important to. Uh, make sure you're balancing it out. Uh, I don't know if you saw that this past week, I think it was, The Atlantic had a good piece about like the 150, how many, hundred some thousand books that apparently uh, Meta has used for training it. I think it's called Books 3. Is that what it's called? I was wondering whether we should make a Wikipedia article for Books 3 just to, to dive deeper into it. But, you know, they have a database. Atlantic made one that you could type in names and figure it out. It'd be great to do an analysis on that to see how good the spread is of the... 150,000 was something, uh, sources that it used for training. Um, but just looking at kind of the representative list, it didn't seem like the real, a real diverse canon there. It kind of reminds me of my, my old school core curriculum at Columbia University, which is often nicknamed the, the parade of dead white men, right? So that is something that I worry about greatly in terms of, you know, if our AI is only as good as that training set or that initial training set, then we're not really setting ourselves up for success. And maybe it is good to, you know, put it on the alpha beta shelf and not rely on it too much at this point. Yeah, yeah and in addition to the lack of diversity, I mean, one thing that uh, maybe it's super obvious and doesn't need to be stated, but the obviously all most of the great majority of AI stuff happening is is quite commercial, um, and has you know very distinct incentives that are quite different from from say Wikipedia, Wikimedia, and the library world. Um, and there have been you know halting efforts toward nonprofit AI efforts, um, and so far those those haven't been super successful. And you know obviously there is going to be there's potentially a challenge you know there, there have been various challenges to to wikipedia and to all sorts of uh, information ecosystems uh and you know coming from a commercial angle and that's a sig significant difference and and potentially you know an area of competition for wikipedia wikimedia uh potentially an area of competition for all sorts of uh, information resources um and not necessarily a healthy competition if it's if it's more commercial driven yeah, I'd, I'd like to come back to that because I think that's a really good point and, and it may point a way forward for the Wikimedia Foundation to, um, you know, because of its, you know, size in comparison to some of the other players here, um, you know, maybe has a role in, in, in fostering the nonprofit side of, of AI. So let's come back to that. Um, but I'd like to open up the conversation now. We've got a number of librarians uh, in this group. Um, and so I think we you know, only have 14 here. So I think, you know, just feel free to, um, to ask your question. And, um, uh, you know, if, if things get too lively, then I'll start calling on people, but I'm not worried about that. So uh, who'd like to start and just asking a question um, or raising a topic? I'm gonna call on Orly if, if, if no one else speaks. <laughs> I'm I'm trying to think of uh, other languages that uh, the impact of uh, how AI availability I would say or the extent of development that it is available for example in Hebrew in Arabic in uh, non Latin uh, um, non Latin languages so how would would that affect the the actual gap gap that there there exists between the the wikipedias i mean if ai is is good for or a good platform or a lead to um to have basic draft good draft for english wikipedia so how to what extent it is available in other languages I have to check this. Just yeah, I, I, th I think I think the uh, one thing that was interesting from Wikimania was seeing 
because we're in the Asia region, a lot more folks there are working with Wikisource, right, as a project to get more digitized text in those languages. Because if we don't have more mm -hmm. Bangla or Urdu or even like Hindi texts in there, as you said, you know, English is just going to win by default, just from volume. Right. So I think that's yeah. why Wikisource is such an interesting project, especially now to get more texts into the corpus of um, AI trainable content. And that is something that I did not realize how undersourced Wikisource was in terms of technical resources. Um, and I and I will I'm kind of uh, ashamed to say that I somehow thought that the foundation is giving adequate a little bit of attention, but no, it's really been just volunteer developers keeping Wikisource chugging along and adding features. And that's really a shame given that if we really are committed to knowledge equity and to make sure that we have more digitized content on Wikimedia projects and that helps the AI out there, um, we're, we're really falling short in that area. So I'd love to see more Wikisource work. Um, but then you see some really wild stuff that I'm not sure is healthy. Some of the AI now that you see, if you watch like TikTok or YouTube shorts, you have people who will do a video in their language. Then you can have the AI translate that spoken stuff into another language, but then reanimate your face to actually speak that language, which is just freaky, amazing, but freaky at the same time. Um, because that means that you can do your content in one language, but then upload the video and make it available in 50, 100 languages, and you're actually looking like you're speaking that language. Um, but that's also the pressure to say like, oh, now we don't need to digitize so many Hindi texts because we have, we can just translate from English. I'm like, that's not necessarily a good solution to these types of things for language, uh, for knowledge diversity, right? Yeah, and my, my impression is that a lot of these sort of the, the, the cutting edge or the larger tools are, are very English focused. Um, they're, you know, they're, they're developed with English and maybe, you know, there are a couple of them like developed in China that are Chinese focused, you know, as, as, as an alternative, but, um, most languages are not going to be very strongly supported. Um, of course, the funny thing about, about chat and, and some of these in particular is that they do have sort of emergent properties of, of, of translation where they sort of understand some languages a little bit, <laughs> um, without being explicitly coded to do so. Um, but it's very variable. Um, it is fairly it actually it, it is fairly useful for translating between some like European languages. So like if you translate between English and Spanish, ChatGPT and similar things are fairly good at that. Um, I've heard some people say that they prefer it to say Google Translate, um, um, and people have used that sometimes for for Wikipedia editing. Um, but I you know I wouldn't I wouldn't bank on it. I wouldn't say that's <laughs> that's like the solution. But it, it is it is one use of it. And also I think there's more continuity between the machine translations that we've had in the past and that are still developing at, and these and these uh, large language models than you know, maybe has been acknowledged. It's, it's another form of artificial intelligence. And it's, um, of course, the, the thing about the large language models is they're extremely language dependent. <laughs> they're not modeling knowledge, they're mo modeling the way people speak. Um, so it's sort of, you know, it, it's, you know, it's like a fast talking uh, salesman um, <laughs> and a scholarly researcher. Um, so yeah, so you should keep in mind that this is a language model rather than a knowledge model, I guess, for the good or no. Well, you know, to, to follow up on that on that topic, uh, there is, as, as we all may know, this uh, abstract Wikipedia that's being developed uh, with the idea of, of using, um, a kind of, at least my understanding, a rules-based approach to translation. So they're you know, developing a set of wiki functions and, and those functions will help to, in the end, um, provide a very uh, accurate level of translation between the articles uh, rather than um, using the machine learning approach which is probabilistic. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering, you know, in terms of, of, of that effort, um, you know, is my impression is it it, it hasn't it, you know it's still kind of in a small niche area. I don't know if it's reached the area of, of librarians, but you know I'd be kind of curious to 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 hear librarians' thoughts on um, you know the the virtues of having both these approaches. This is a question I've asked in, in other contexts as well. But I'm just curious. We, we we seem to be in some sense hedging our bets. One based on this kind of rule based approach, which is which is very accurate uh, to translate articles between various Wikipedia's editions. The the other one. Um, 
based on some of the you know the the tools that we we're just talking about. Um, ha has anyone in, in this call been involved in, in Abstract Wikipedia and, and you know sort of been exploring their tool set as it develops and have you know it, you know could make a comparison for us? And if not, maybe that's something we should all look into. I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, dodge your question while other people think about all it. All right, all right, Jerry, you go ahead. That probably wasn't the best question, so ask another one. <laughs> like I'm a librarian, I don't, I haven't used ChatGPT that much. My organization is wrestling with like how AI is going to impact our work. Uh, like we have a working group looking at it. Um, and I guess like one of the information literacy gaps right now, I think, is that librarians don't really understand how how large language models work. And so like we're in that circumstance, you're going to have people take like an all or nothing uh, approach to it when working with patrons. So one thing I maybe you all of our like this has been great for me, like one thing i'd like to see maybe from wikipedia and libraries is like um more um examples of ai in wikipedia because that's something i think a librarian can look at and say here's an article like the one on richard shared um and here's what people had to do to make it reliable um and in and you know the signpost uh issue that was written mostly with AI uh, a year ago or so. I can't remember when that happened. It was really helpful to, to like these sorts of examples help librarians get their head around what's happening. Um, and then like there are other things too, like I manage the institutional repository. At, um, we make things open access. I've already had scholars ask me to take things down because they didn't want to feed a large language model, which felt somewhat fruitless to me but there's those kind of questions that i think librarians are going to increasingly get with a limited understanding of what a large language model is what the how it what its impacts are um and so i do think we need more examples and a group like this really could uh help the profession out in that way maybe people are already working on it and i don't know uh, that's my question is someone working on that <laughs> i think one area that i think i think andrew can speak of uh, well in particular is as uh as i'm probably i'm sorry i'm not sure it's a gay gay or uh how you pronounce that um uh, is is uh is, is connecting uh language to metadata so generating metadata based on human language um including like you know like library records catalog entries We've had a lot of uh, we've had a lot of stuff at say working with the Metropolitan Museum of Art and, and other museums where there is um, information about 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 an artwork or something in the collection that's like um, from uh, the the latter third of the nineteenth century uh, from uh, from southern France maybe Provence possibly Marseille <laughs> um, a lot of these sort of like hedging language type things that aren't easily translated to metadata and using AI. Uh, to translate those into metadata, which is not the same thing as writing article text. It's more of the other way around. But obviously, this metadata is useful um, on Wikipedia, on Wikidata in particular. Um, and it it does automate, you know, in a not too creative, not too dangerous fashion, um, a lot of these, you know, sort of handwritten notes that have been developed over the years. Yeah, I think uh, just to add to that, we we don't do a great job of cataloging things because we wind up like having, okay. you know, unfortunately, um, you know, whether it's very much commons folks are discussing AI and images or the individual Wikipedia editions are are debating things there. Um, so the the discussion is very diffuse. Uh, so that did motivate me to at least try to put more links on the meta page for artificial intelligence, which is kind of old and skimpy right now, but uh, I put some links in the chat. The artificial, the Wikipedia colon, or if you say WP colon AI in Wikipedia English, has a pretty good list of experiments, discussions, uh, Richard's experiments, my experiments, a lot of other people's experiments. Um, 
but we should try to catalog those better so we can have one-stop shopping to understand kind of where things are at. But even then, like Commons has is rapidly changing, right? They just recently had a huge burst of folks putting up like entire categories up for deletion because of like they were did, done by mid-journey and people were like saying this is out of scope for commons, which is always a um, a, a term of art and not science is what, what is scope in commons. Um, so yeah, it's, it's tough to document such a fast moving train, but we try. There's also an artificial intelligence telegram channel in case anyone's interested. Um, not super busy, but has good meaningful uh, discussions, especially when news articles come out, like the latest Authors Guild issue. I don't know if folks saw that. Um, that is a, a big um, point of uh, discussion right now as to whether the Authors Guild suing um, OpenAI is a legit thing, because pretty much what the Authors Guild is saying is that every Wikipedia editor summarizing a book is violating the copyright of that book, which is not true, right? So in essence, they're accusing OpenAI of doing what a Wikipedia editor does. Um, so that's interesting to see what the merits are of, of those types of cases. So those are some of the things that we wind up discussing in our AI Telegram group and other things like that. If you, anyone wants to join that, contact Richard or myself. We can add you there. That, that would be great. Um, yeah, thanks for um, connecting us with that discussion. Um, are, are there others that would like to ask questions? If not, I've got one that um, I think is something that I've been thinking about again with with you know kind of your questions in mind, Jerry. That you know how, how can we begin using these tools maybe uh, beyond sort of just off the shelf tools? And one of the areas that I think is growing most rapidly right now is it's it's gotten a new acronym just within the last few weeks, um, which is RAG, Retrieval Augmented Generation. Um, and the idea there is that you will use one of these large language models in conjunction with uh, a reliable source of some sort that can, can, in sense, fill in factual information that's not present in the model's internal space. Uh, and so th the idea there would be that, uh, you know, you could connect, for example, a library database with a large language model, ask a question, and then get answers that draw on that database for um, you know for its response and and this has been I think a very quickly commercializing area we've seen for example um, that there are now systems for law that allow you to do research not like this poor lawyer that that put in um, oh yeah good we, we need to create an article Andrew uh, not like this poor lawyer that that you know put in uh, his his brief into chat GPT and then and submitted in court with all the kind of fake references but you know uh, now there are tools that'll will you actually go out and, and search the corpus of genuine li legal literature and bring in those references. You know, whether they bring in the right ones is still an open question. But I think one of the questions I have is for librarians, um, is this a goal that we should be working toward, which is connecting our sources of information to these large language models so that we could synthesize answers with reliable sources? Or is in that some sense, um, you know, um, you know, I think you could even see it as some people do as a, as a threat to our profession. And since, you know, we're really automating ourselves out of existence, which is a worry across a whole number of knowledge working domains. So I'd love to hear your thoughts about, you know, that particular approach, but also, um, you know, where this is headed if we really succeed in the way that we're speculatively thinking could be possible. I could be wrong, uh, but I'm not familiar with the concept of retrieval augmented generation, and I guess it's, you say it's a new one, so maybe I feel less bad about it, but um, <laughs> but I, I think I may have seen it, uh, because I think, uh, and correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, but I think this this may be sort of the approach that the Wikimedia Foundation took with its um, with its product called WikiGBT, uh, which it which it launched uh, yeah, months that's, ago. Yeah, I think exactly right, exactly. It's, it's in the same line of things, where it draws on Wikipedia for factual information, but with a large language model doing the front end synthesis of the text generation yeah so that that's an interesting experiment i, I encourage people if, if you want to learn about there's there's a long new york times magazine article about uh centered around that but also about ai in 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 wikipedia wikimedia as well um but definitely i think it's it's interesting and you know potentially dangerous <laughs> i'm sure for, um and from a library librarian point of view And maybe someone who hasn't spoken yet. I'd love to, you know, we, we, we want to sort of make sure that we get all voices included. Is there anyone that hasn't contributed yet that would like to express a thought?
And okay, we've got one in the chat. Um, uh, this is from Anne. Um, I've been seeing an increase in deceptive AI generated content farm websites. Any thought on how Wikipedia could be used as a more powerful verification tool? That's a really interesting question. Um, and I think it's it's a worry. There was an article recently, I, I forget where it was, uh, but it basically said, you know, we're moving into a new era in which large portions of the internet are gonna be generated by AI. Um, and how, you know, we're, we're sort of moving into, you know, a strange new world of just interacting with AI online all the time. But I, I do think this is a worry. Um, is, there, um, is there a way in which we can be using Wikipedia to to help us suss out what's legitimate and what's not legitimate in terms of all these AI generated sources that are just proliferating? It's a great question. Any thoughts about that? Yeah, I think I'll, uh, I'll bring it back to our... Go ahead. No, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead, Richard. Oh, no, I think it, I think it is, is obviously a general problem. There's, you know, um, th there was there was a time when there were not so many spammers and not so many, you know, cheap labor exploited on the internet, and that added a new level of difficulty in finding interesting things. Um, and obviously, AI has only compounded this, you know, and it, it is probably more much more likely to expand in the future many many fold in terms of the the cheap content farms you see. It makes it much cheaper and much easier to generate all sorts of you know, vaguely meaningful uh, content in, in large quantities. So I go ahead, Andrew. Yeah, I mean, this is just a uh, yet another time to hop on the why don't we have a real citation database <laughs> saw that we've had in our movement for a long time, which is the promise of something like Wikisite, right? Because um, it would be great to have a real structured database of all our citations, how often they're used, in what way, so that when folks are trying to build better reliable information reliability systems or knowledge reliability systems. They can actually, you know, query our database of stuff and to know exactly, you know, we've done so much great volunteer labor over 20 plus years to sift good from bad, to put in references to site stuff, but it's unstructured and it's all just stuck in wiki text. And wouldn't it be great if we actually had that in a real database to serve not only our movement, but the world at large, right? And it's, uh, sad that we've been talking so long for a real citation database, but we don't have it. So some folks have tried to move forward on it, like Internet Archive has, because of their bot, they already monitor what are reliable and unreliable links. So they've done a version of this, but wouldn't it be great if we had a real one that people could hit and use for um, verification? And we just don't have that right now. And also, I, I guess people will be drawing more and more people, you know, these 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 the AI models are scraping websites, and of course, increasingly websites can be AI generated, and that you know obviously will lead to declining quality. There's there's been some experiments with I think of of of, of drawing some of these language models from uh, from computer generated text, and they just they, they turn in quickly turn into like pure nonsense. Um, so hopefully there'll be a place for for something that's that that has a little bit of human sense in it um, in the internet, and hopefully you know at some point the various platforms will see it's it's valuable to have some human knowledge at the core. Well, in, in, in fact, I, I, I'd love to, to touch on that because um, this is a concern, I think, that's been raised several times in, in these discussions in the Wikimedia community, which is uh, this question of context collapse. Uh, so, you know, this is, this is a technical issue with the way that these large language models are generated. And let me just put this in a nutshell term, which is, you know, probably the level of my understanding of this as well. Um, but the idea here is that when you're training these models, right now you're training them on human-generated text, the discourse of, of human knowledge, um, you know, as it's represented on the internet. As we move forward, and that discourse contains a lot of you know, these AI farms that are just generating kind of, you know, lucid but but really not meaningful text, then you're beginning to train the large language models on the human text plus the AI-generated text. And it's been shown that as you do that, the quality of the AI models actually decreases over time. And um, it can start just uh, producing, you know, results that are much more similar to the kind of barely lucid text than to the human discourse. And the this 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 the what's been this has been labeled as the problem of context collapse, in in which uh, the, the models uh, fail to, to uh, have enough, you know, in a sense, reliable sources or um, non-AI sources to, to actually be able to generate uh, meaningful um, new outputs. 
And so I think that one of the concerns is Wikipedia has been, you know, a very reliable source, we've said, for training these models. But if Wikipedia itself has, you know, a lot of AI generated text, in, in some sense, that threatens the viability of these future models. Now, whether we we care about that question is is, a, is another one. But I think that uh, there is this this worry that, um, you know, we may be compromising the very sources that have allowed this AI to come into existence. And you put a, a great term to this, which uh, um, I'd love. <laughs> and we've got a lot of writing to do. We've got a lot of Wikipedia articles we have to write. But can you explain uh, model autophagy disorder, Andrew? That's that's a great term. I haven't heard. Yeah, this is, you know, I only ran to this term recently, but we've known the phenomenon for a while. If you train AI on AI, as Richard mentioned, it kind of collapses very quickly. Um, uh, it's, you know, the the way they describe it is um, from this piece that I put in there. Without enough fresh real data in each generation of an autographous loop, future generative models are doomed to have their quality or precision or diversity progressively decrease right so it's kind of like garbage not only garbage in garbage out garbage in garbage out feeding another garbage in and it just downward spirals into much worse um, outcomes and that's something that you know i think people in this space are very cognizant of and that's why it's important that when you're um going out into you know web scrapes you're, you know what kind of as you said cliff uh, context that you're grabbing things from because it's almost like inbreeding, right? If you want to use a biological uh, analogy and you don't want to inbreed all the AI data, right? Um, and that's somewhat related to the, the question you asked before, Cliff, about um, abstract Wikipedia, right? It's like the question is, of course, it seems like AI would be a very good fit for what abstract Wikipedia is about. And even before the explosion of ChatGPT, Denny, who is the leader of that, you know, had already kind of meditated on the fact that of course ai seems to be part of the solution in the future but the big problem with all these technologies you know especially the generative ones is that they're really quite quite a black box like you don't get to see the intermediate steps and to twist this and push that in a way that you're used to seeing on like a pipeline or something it really is kind of like you feed it what you can at the beginning and this neural net takes over and then it spits out something monolithic at the end and nothing is really explainable. The intermediate steps are not explained, and they're not tweakable. But the outputs are so impressive in many cases that you kind of say, well, it's not perfect, but my god, it's doing a lot more than I thought it ever could. But that's not good enough for abstract Wikipedia, right? So the way Danny says, and a lot of AI researchers say, is that you need like explainable or um, what they call explainable AI, but basically a way to deconstruct the steps so that you can tweak it and improve it. Because otherwise, it's it's kind of useless to, to keep doing it. And you're starting to see the same thing with ChatGPT in that you you put the exact same out inputs into ChatGPT as you did six months ago, and the outputs are very, very different because the system itself has morphed and reacted to all the inputs that have come in. And that's kind of problematic as well if you want repeatability and predictability. And I think that's the main reason why Abstract Wikipedia has so far said, certainly interesting for the future but not now uh not at this stage because we don't have explainable um interrogatable ai along the way and you know not having um, visibility into that uh process means it's pretty much useless because you need to be able to find out exactly what it's doing at every step yeah i think it's a it's a it's a it's an admirable countercultural stance which i think serves the project uh, at this stage yeah no, I admire it too. Absolutely, um, and and thank you. That's that's really helpful, Andrew. I think just for thinking about uh, where it exists, and I think you know, in some sense, hedging our bets and and you know, proceeding on different routes is you know part of the spirit of of the Wikimedia universe too. And you know, um, we don't want to just throw all, everything into one hat and hope it works out. Um, this is great. I I, I want to end our, our conversation. We just have a few minutes left. Um, because we're hoping to host a series of this AI salons. And so uh, if people have thoughts about, you know, and, and Jerry, you were expressing some of these, but I think others too, you know, where we can be most helpful to librarians now and kind of grappling with these issues. Uh, you know, Orly and I are all ears as we organize these. So please let us know, you, you know, you can obviously email us afterwards, but if you'd like to just think about, um, you know, other topics in relationship to AI that you'd like to hear discussed, um, Please let us know because we'll we'll plan to organize one every month 
uh, for the next several months. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. <laughs> we're, we're happy for this discussion too. You know, I think it's um, you know this has been in incredibly enlightening, and um, it, thanks for the the feedback. And um, and Andrew and Richard, you you know, I couldn't we couldn't have started off with better guests than you. Um, we really really appreciate your time here. Um, so, um, Orly, do you have any any final thoughts before we we break? I keep putting you on the spot. I'm sorry, and you're on mute. <laughs> yeah, I think it um, encouraged me to to try. Actually, I didn't try using AI to write a Wikipedia article, nor in English, not in the Hebrew. Uh, I would try. Yeah. So yeah. maybe if anyone wants to take an, an assignment, you can use you can use AI to try to write some some of these Wikipedia articles about model autophagy disorder <laughs> yeah and uh, <laughs> what is there <laughs> well i think the, the best of, our, the best insight our, i had uh, is that <laughs> our title what was it <laughs> i would, tr title, I would yeah. try to, I to Hebrew, translate yeah. it actually yeah it's in i think danish and uh portuguese maybe so it's on hebrew yet i think yeah. there's, there's two great insights about using chat gpt for wikipedia writing one is um it, it just gets over the kind of the the inertia many ways right it's like if you think i think if you're conscientious wikipedia you're like okay what's the lead sentence going to be do i have all my sources do i know um how to spell this person's name right where did they go to school so enough if you're the type of person that these are like stack up your brain and go ah i can't deal with all that the nice yeah, thing about the starting the yeah, starting exactly. point Get you over the hump, right? <laughs> yes. say, which also yes. plays into one of our famous laws that Ward Cunningham came up with, Cunningham's law, right? It's it's uh, the best way to get to the right answer is to post the wrong answer. So the funny thing is like having ChatGPT post a only half correct article is sometimes a really good motivation for you to 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 edit because like, oh my God, that's so wrong. Let me fix that, you know? And it's sometimes right. good that ChatGPT has flaws because it gives you something to do. Otherwise, it's like, this is boring. Copy, paste, copy, paste, right? Yeah. Maybe in the future, the chat with DBT will uh, replace the Wikipedians. They will write the, the articles themselves. I think for certain sector of articles, that might be true. You know, for like sports <laughs> figures, like cricket players, yeah. <laughs> you know, minor league yeah. cricket players, which make up tons of our articles. Those wow. can 80% be written by chat GPT. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Sports figures, you know. It'd be nice to like just summarize, you know, books and stories that are from like, you know, that no one has the time to read them all, but just have some basic summaries and just make sure they're they're okay and, and have the community edited so to correct them and link to the relevant concepts and relevant Wikipedia articles. I mean, there's so many, uh, there's so many, there's so many like literary works that are just not, there's not even a simple plot summary in Wikipedia, which is kind of annoying. Yeah, I totally agree. And there's a, a campaign, every book, it's reader, I think, which would, you know, make a great intersection with that summarization effort. Um, so we should reach out to them and, and talk to them about that. Um, fantastic, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. This has really been wonderful. And we will look forward to seeing you next month. And again, uh, thank you, Andrew and Richard, for uh, leading us in this conversation. It's been wonderful. Um, appreciate everyone's time. And we will see you again soon. Thank you so much. Thanks, thank everyone. You. It's been fun. Bye. Bye.